Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, for the sixth time, uh, a conference about how to uh, decide the end of life of boats and uh, about the techniques and about the issues around it, about the environmental legislation around it. It is really a topic which is uh, keeping the industry busy, uh, not only the industry, but also the legislators, whether we are in Europe, whether we are I say on international within IMO, the International Maritime Organization. Myself uh, involved with this discussion since 97 within ICOMIA, and that uh, particular time I was chairing the environmental committee of ICOMIA. And um, Norway, who started as uh, one of the first associations with a study on how to, uh, as I say, cope the issues around end of life of boats, in this case, abandoned boats. GRP boats in Norway. And so we started within our industry the whole discussion. I like to uh, remind everybody last year we had an, um, a very good uh, conference. We have more than 10 people attending. And we started with the main questions uh, related to the designs of new boats. Is it possible to design it such a way and is it possible to use in your design such a kind of uh, materials and uh, uh, coping in, in one hand with let's say the legislative legislations uh, whether it's technical whether it's environment and the other side also uh, the ability to dismantle uh, GRP boats normal boats steel wood doesn't matter, all kinds of boats. Um, we had a wonderful uh, and a very successful uh, feedback from everybody. And now we have um, the second chance and the second challenge, as I call it, to be more practical and to make sure that we are able to do it in our industry. Avoiding legislation is the main task for us, but that means we have to be proactive. And I'd like to start with uh, Corinna. You are seeing, let's say, a lot of uh, discussions around and a lot of studies, uh, microplastics, uh, the plastic soup, um, uh, all these items. These are already um, more or less related to the upcoming and current legislations. Uh, myself attending all kinds of meetings with the European Commission and other international bodies seeing that it's coming strict. But do you have any idea or any opinion how we can let's say cope uh, with the end of life of boats avoiding uh, pollution of uh, microplastics and other kind of plastics and at the same time uh, to be uh, proactive um thank you for the question i think it's kind of a complex question to be honest um i'm quite new um coming into the um, topic of boating industry and how the boating industry has an impact on the marine environment. Um, I've only um, discovered this association, this, this potential association of boating industry and um, impact uh, into plastic pollution about two, three years ago, and only by accident. And suddenly, you know, it, it's like opening a pan Pandora box. I, I, I'm getting um, used to various aspects of, of um, um, the boating industry and the potential relationship with the marine. Uh, impact. Um, I think there are two components here that have to be very clearly um, uh, separated. Um, one of them is the, the issue of the abandoned boats and the um, impact of um, uh, those massive structures on uh, particular habitats in the marine environment. And here I'm talking about estuaries, coasts, but also, you know, going offshore, um, coral reefs, sea grasses, mangroves, and so on. Um, and then we're talking about the uh, uh, GRP as dust that is um, um, produced by crushing the material or by cutting the material. 
Um, and this is actually the one that I came across first. They, they're very fine dust um, that um, I could see coming out of, of uh, um, a boatyard in Chichester Harbour um, as a result of, of um, repairs and, and maintenance works that were done over there. Dust that was blown into the water in Chichester. Um, and that was the basis for um, my, my research later on to look at the um, behavior of this very, very fine dust. What, what is the fate once the dust reaches the uh, marine environment and um, uh, what would be the effects? And unfortunately, I'm, I'm still looking for the fate as in how exactly is transported and where does it end in the uh, marine environment. Um, but the effects are, are pretty immediate and, and um, uh, pretty damaging to say. Um, the microplastic, the, the plastic or the resin component on the, of the GRP being very, very light will, will um, uh, float and will con contribute to that plastic pollution that we are talking about here. Um, but the other component, the glass being heavier, will um, actually sediment um, and will um, have a, a, a big impact on the um, floor, on the seafloor, and will be accessible for, for the organism uh, and will be ingested. And um, I'm, I'm afraid to say that it will have an even uh, more damaging impact on the uh, organism than um, the microplastics. So, um, yes, those, those are the two problems that I've seen so far associated with, with the, the boating industry, with the, the abandoned boats on one side, and then the, the, the works and the crushing of the boats that happen in the boat yards. And I think that's where, from my point of view, um, the research has to be concentrated to um, determining, you know, what are the, the, the threats and what are the solutions so that um, in the end, everything can, can be done, you know, with a, a greater respect for the marine environment and um, with more care um, to, to not, I'm not sure if we can say stop the pollution, but mitigate the impact if, if possible. Yeah. Okay. So in fact, you're saying we have to pay more attention to the technical uh, measures around uh, dismantling and yes. crushing all the materials. Definitely. And that will be the same. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, then I'd like to go to Ivan. Um, we, we're talking about, let's say, uh, and you heard, let's say, also before the what we call the closed loop uh, solution and um, is it uh, possible for, for our industry? And I'd like to know your opinion about this. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting time to be thinking about composites recycling and the opportunities that will exist in the future for not only extracting the uh, you know, energy values and, and physical property values in a very rudimentary way, but also finding ways to really reincorporate um, resin or fiber in constructive properties. And I know Mario has a lot more experience in doing something like this than I do, but here in the United States, um, the cement kiln has been that stepping stone for us to build capacity and capability within um, the marine industry as a composite using sector to get that material at the end of life collected, processed, prepared, and transported to somebody that has um, a bigger plan for um, you know, capturing those, those secondary values um, you know, here in the United States, a lot of that motivation has been, um, as I know it was in Europe, pushed by the wind industry and the technology behind wind turbine blades. Um, we've seen a tremendous amount of funding go towards the repowering of wind turbines. So that's meaning large volumes of blades here in the United States accumulating. And with that accumulation, there's been great interest to understand, um, you know, how that clean secondary life cycle material can be recaptured and repurposed in a closed loop fashion. Um, and we're seeing tremendous amounts of money go towards solutions that involve uh, pyrolysis and the incorporation of secondary materials from other end of life products. Um, I think it all comes down to the economics as, as we've discussed in these forums in the past, 
um, when these outlets, as they evolve, begin to um, show their viability, begin to show um, their ability to tap into a market for um, you know the demand that, that that's behind these kinds of secondary life cycle uh, products. You know, you'll, you'll see um, you know more and more opportunity to build a bridge between um, recyclers and the marine industry as a source of of uh, secondary recycled material. So you strongly believe in this uh, kind of solutions? Is that already in practice? I think that you know we're seeing the, the real practice being done by folks like Mario and, and the leaders here in the European Union. I think in the United States, uh, at the university level, there are a lot of promising outlets. Ultimately, whether we're talking about boats or blades or other end of life products, there's going to be a, a spectrum of, of options available to folks. And depending on what your region looks like, depending on what your economic flexibility looks like, you're going to be utilizing different end users at different times. And each of those outlets are going to have uh, you know, different volumes that they're going to be able to take on uh, a regular basis, on an annual basis. And so I think you'll see uh, a patchwork begin to evolve, not only here in the United States, but elsewhere um, that reflects not only what's you know, possible from a technical standpoint, but um, you know, what people have access to and, and what really makes the most sense from a business standpoint. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, I think it's quite important that we are not only focusing on Europe, but also, uh, let's say, on international uh, solutions. Um, I'd like to go to uh, Steve. Um, two items I think are quite important. First of all, uh, it's also very important to have more knowledge about your uh, uh, practical uh, experience as, uh, let's say, uh, disampling with uh, the goods. But also, um, you heard there's a possibility to avoid legislation. That means that we have to set up uh, a scheme. Um, personally, uh, I did something for boatyards who are, let's say, uh, building new boats. We had what we call a dock discipline inside of a dry dock. What kind of disciplines to avoid any pollution from uh, dust, uh, microplastics, and all that stuff. So something similar for uh, disassembling uh, boats. And do you think that it's uh, that you already have enough uh, measures in place to avoid any pollution? Okay, thanks, Albert. Um, I've been breaking boats now for the best part of 15 years, and I have probably the biggest boat breaking yard in the UK, um, certainly bigger than most I've seen in, the, in Europe. And um, we are crunching boats on a daily basis. Um, the issue that we have with breaking boats is, is not breaking them up. That's straightforward and easy enough for us to do. It's, it's actually getting people to pay. And how do they pay and who should pay? Because the, the question is always, someone's got to pay. So uh, who will? Now, you, you could suggest that um, the boat builder it, it pays a levy at the point of build. And maybe it's a percentage of the boat's value that gets put into a pot held by the government. Let's call them that. And um, we and any other boat breaker in, in the area can then call upon that money to use to, uh, to, to cover the cost of breaking that boat. Um, that's all well and good. But you know, as, as we spoke earlier, before this discussion started, um, boats have been being built since about 1953. Uh, that's 67 years of, fi of fiberglass boats. And even if some sort of legislation was put in today, we've still got 67 years worth of boats to break and we're not going to get the original boat builder to pay for that. So how else could we do it? Well, there's another um, a, a thought that maybe the insurers um, add a small levy to every insurance premium. Now, once again, that's all well and good, but that still leaves those 67 years worth of boats unpaid for. Um, but it's a good start. Um, if every insurer were to put a, a pound a month, let's say, or two pounds a month on a premium on a policy, May not be enough, but you know, I'm, I'm not um, I'm not a financial guy. Um, it would help towards the future boats that are being built today. So in 20, 20, 30, 40 years time, when those boats are up for uh, crunching, um, there's some money put aside. The problem we get is that in 67 years, that boat that was built back in 19, let's say 1970, was in today's money 200,000 euros. Um, today, that 200,000 euro boat's worth an eBay price of maybe a pound. 
And the people that buy these boats are guys and girls that don't have more than a few pounds and um, can't really afford their boats in the first place. And what happens is they will live on those boats and they will use them like floating caravans. And once that boat starts to leak or something becomes more expensive than they can afford, quite easily in the UK, you can literally step off it and leave it. In the UK, there is no legislation um, suggesting that uh, an owner of a boat um, should be listed as the owner. Um, in, the, in the States, every boat has got a number branded down the side and indeed most European countries have a, a process in, in place or, uh, that ensures that an owner of a boat is, is known. Here in the UK, you can completely get away with it. I can go today onto eBay or somewhere like that, buy a boat for a pound, uh, and that'd be that, live on it and do what I like. Equally, the other problem here in the UK is that the larger boat marinas are very happy to take people's money and um, keep you keep paying for those boats. But at some point, you can't afford their expensive mooring fees. So what they then do is rather than take responsibility and dispose of that boat, because quite frankly, that boat is, of, is at end of life, um, they won't pay. They put it up on a on-site, on, online uh, auction site, let's call it eBay, and um, these boats get sold for a pound. Indeed, at that point, the responsibility of that particular boatyard or marina has been uh, bypassed. And in fact, they can just pass them on for a quid. The boat then disappears up the, up the river and then gets used for a month or two or maybe not at all and then gets left and abandoned. And we then get the call to come and collect. Who pays? Then it's the local authorities or the owner of the land or, or very rarely it's the owner of the boat who pays for us to dispose of it. Then the issue is, is that the product that we produce, which is not pure, clean fiberglass, but it's a mixture of, um, of fiberglass and layers of oils and bits of wood or foam or Christ knows what's in between all these layers of, of the boat that gets built. Um, we can't easily dispose of it. And I know in Germany and a few other places, there's some fantastic ways of getting rid of it with regards to just burning it, but converting that energy into energy that you can reintroduce into the national grid. Um, and uh, indeed, uh, from Karina's point of view, um, it means that there isn't any dirty waste. There's no dust. There's no nothing. We could literally take an entire boat once we pop the engine out and take the windows out, let's say. We could pass it over to Germany and they could burn it. And that's the end of it. And all that is waste then is the, is the metals that melt down and that can be recycled. And then you've got just the glass in effect, a blob of glass that's left that also can be melted back down again and reused. Now, I do simplify this. Um, and it's a lot more complicated than that. But uh, the problem that we've got is not disposing them. We can chuck them away all day long. But in the UK, there is no legislation. There's no ulterior place for us to do than to grind these things down into a smallest portion that we can get them down into. And then they go to landfill. Now, that's no good. It is no good. Now, I could grind them down into a bag of dust, but nobody will buy that bag of dust from me and use that as a... a, a um, as a, as a fuel. So it, it, I'm in a funny, funny situation. I, I can teach you all how to break boats and you're welcome to come and see how it gets done. And we dominate the market with regards to online. Um, everybody knows of us. We even have a TV show. Um, but there is no easy way of getting rid of it. So the easiest way is to get it prepaid by the insurance companies, by governments and by others that put some sort of levy on it in the first place. I know I'm not talking about boat breaking, in a sense, but I'm talking about my problem is that somebody has to pay and um, we, we could be really busy if there was some sort of way of getting rid of it uh, that was yeah. paid for. So uh, just uh, two quick questions. Um, one of the things is uh, always uh, keeping me busy is how do you divide the different uh, materials? That's just quite important because that's yeah. one part where you're quite... Uh, and if you yeah. are combine it all together, then it's possible what you are saying, burn it in Germany. But yeah. first of all, is it possible to, to divide all the different materials? Secondly, uh, in, in that uh, relation, um, if there will be, uh, let's say, whether it's legislations or regulations in the form of, uh, men of uh, uh, voluntary rules to... Um, um, to be able to use all the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, recycled materials. 
that that's let's say the main question so yeah. on one hand you are the let's say breaking down the boat and somebody else has to make sure that it's delivered on the right way and somebody else yeah uh, has to make you sure that we can use the recycled materials yeah and that and i think if we find a solution of course with the money and uh, i think the suggestion of insurance is a quite good one i've seen something similar with gas systems so it can work uh, that should be uh, good okay well well, Albert, um, when it comes to uh, a boat, that they are, in effect, uh, if you could use an analogy of using like an, an egg, uh, once mm -hmm. you've cracked that egg, there's not much left inside it. And in fact, inside a boat, there's not a lot. There's a lot of fresh air and, and places for you to sit and enjoy that boat. We pop out those engines, we take off the bulkheads, we take the windows out and take the mast down. I'm, I'm simplifying it. All yeah. of those items are completely recyclable because they're made of metals or other stuff that can be reused. Fiberglass itself is the problem. Now, when a boat is built, it's not built as a, as a single... Uh, in fact, let's use a, a, a wing from a generator as a, as a slightly different example. They are built in the same kind of way. They're laid up with gel coats and, and mats and layers and layers and layers until eventually you've got yourself a, a wing. Um, yeah. Now, if you were to chop that wing down the middle, they are not made with wood inside. Um, in fact, they, they are, have got some sort of um, layers of stuff to give the strength, but it's much easier to break that stuff up. If we get even more simplistic and look at a, a garage door, uh, a garage door, which is made of fiberglass, is literally just fiberglass and a gel coat layer giving it that mm -hmm. color. Now, that is really easy to recycle because we can literally put that through a machine and uh, Evan can confer, I'm sure, he'd chuck it into a great big brick kiln, give it a spin and it's down to dust and that's the end of it. Mix it up with the, with the cement and you could do what you like with it. I know in Italy, I know in China, they chop up boat or fiberglass into sort of cubes, small cubes, and mix it with concrete and build cheap roads with it. But um, it's just used as a filler. The problem we've got when breaking boats up is that it's not getting all the engine and the mast down and the windows out. That's easy. We can do that easy, and we do do that. And in fact, all those mm -hmm. components get recycled in some way or other. Either we sell them through our websites, and people come and buy those bits from us, and they get completely yeah. reused again. Or indeed, they go for re repurpose, re um, recycling. Okay, but that is a good start for Mario. Can you uh, give us an, uh, an update? Let's say, what is your uh, experience up to now? I know that uh, Italy uh, did a lot of uh, studies around it, and also uh, to use the the materials, um, uh, different uh, situations. Can you uh, give us uh, an update? And what is the progress, uh, let's say, with your uh, approach on uh, breaking down boats? Thank you, Albert, and uh, thank you to Ecomia for organizing this stimulating meeting. It's, uh, it's so odd <laughs> to be on a, a web um, discussion and you cannot show things that you really do. But uh, I think last year we gave a, a sort of, a, let's say, preview of what were the target of our research, because I, I am a researcher after all, I'm not an entrepreneur. So I would be very, very glad to deepen the knowledge which we put inside the problem of uh, recycling materials with people that is really on the, on the, on the, on the field like yeah. Steve, like uh, Corinne, even, and the other people here. Feel. But the problem is that uh, we were running, uh, let's say, advanced experiments on recycling of uh, fiberglass reinforced uh, resins with a company here in the south of Italy since the last meeting um, uh, in Amsterdam, but uh, everything had to be stopped for uh, the problems of lockdown and uh, yeah. we are uh, even we are not uh, working in the lab uh, at the CNR uh, regularly because uh, it's a sort of stop and go stop and go so it's not easy so the principles are still there our um, the base idea that we we follow is to not to separate but uh, to maintain materials mixed together and uh, um, let's say overcoming the, the diversity of individual material 
uh, working on a sort of a macro uh, envelope in which the material can be embedded and possibly this micro envelope should not be a thermal setting that then gives back the problem to the next generation, but possibly to embed the um, material in a thermoplastic uh, uh, matrix. Uh, and possibly the thermoplastic matrix must come from a stream of end of life other materials. And uh, if we talk about plastic, the most, let's say, uh, the most uh, important area is the area of packaging. And among the packaging material, the most uh, um, problematic issue is about the expanded uh, uh, packaging. So we came, we started with this idea. Can we embed um, a, a mixture of uh, thermosetting granules coming from dismantling of both, but not only windmill, um, containers, uh, cars. Actually, we started with the carbon fiber uh, aircrafts uh, uh, coming from a company in the south of Italy that works for the Boeing um, to, to embed this material um, uh, grinded in a smaller piece in a safe way. And so starting with the finding the best solution for grinding, for catching dust and powders, collecting them and using them as a fine filler in a more coarse filler. And at the end, embedding this material in a way that the heterogeneity is let's say less important than the macro scale properties of the material. Working on the physical uh, um, behavior, on the aspect ratio of the material, uh, work, looking at them as a sort of, uh, of um, granules made of chopped strand uh, fibers inside uh, a solid uh, um, matrix. And at the end, we came with uh, some quite interesting results. And uh, in terms of uh, homogeneity of behavior of this, uh, at the end, uh, composite, thermoplastic composite uh, material, you can embed it. You can uh, overcome the, 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 the heterogeneity with the, a macro scale homogeneity of properties. Of course, this material must find um, a market not directly or um, seldom directly linked uh, to the marine industry, but it can go to other application. After all, Europe now imports all raw material from abroad. There is uh, Italy in particular, but even many countries of Europe do not produce any more uh, plastics do not produce anymore. We convert, actually, we convert the thermosetting material, we convert plastic. So if we want to be, say, really impacting on the, um, on the, um, on the cost of materials for Europe, we must extend the life of the material, not for the same application, but um, working on a, a value chain anyway. So yeah. the idea is there. The samples are made. We were building a, a larger plant, uh, uh, pilot plant, here in, uh, in, uh, in Italy uh, to, to make the proof of uh, evidence on an industrial scale. We are still working on that to make uh, furniture materials, to make, um, to make uh, um, uh, items like uh, uh, lamps uh, um, or... Um, or uh, flooring, uh, looking at the cost performance ratio. Yeah. But uh, still the idea is there. Do not separate uh, the, mat the materials. Of course, uh, let's say designing for disassembling is very important, but I see difficult to use, uh, to let's say, to get rid of adhesive, of glue, 
of sealant in the marine industry. It's very difficult uh, for the requirements. Maybe it's easier for uh, other uh, field of application of thermosetting uh, uh, fiber reinforced resin. But for uh, uh, ships, for uh, boating industry, to get rid of sealant, which mix uh, the very real difficult of, uh, of disassembling, it's very difficult. So, Let's try. And the other way in which it's important to work is normatives. We yeah. work with the Uni in Italy, which is an ISO uh, version for Italy of the normatives. If the legislation will follow the normatives, if there are normatives existing on that, the legislation will build up an end of uh, life uh, um, so legislation. Yeah. And so linking together technology, normatives, which, stabil, um, which uh, state the minimum requirement for an application and legislation, possibly we can overcome the problem of uh, just uh, wasting and uh, landfilling uh, valuable material like uh, yeah. uh, GFR. In, in that case, I can tell you that there's already, at least because I'm one of the uh, conveners within ISO, there is already an, uh, a request to start again a new ISO standard in relation to our industry. And maybe you can remember we had roughly, I think it was 10 years ago in Italy, also a discussion about uh, the new standard. Yeah. So maybe that's uh, promising. But if you don't mind, I'd like to give the word to Phil. So, I mean, I guess there's, there's two or three things really from the, the uh, point of view of the, the boat user. One is to make it easy for them to do this. That, you know, as Steve says, he's, yeah. he's, he's one of very few places in the UK, for example, where the, the, the breaking happens. Um, and to think about what legislation is required that will actually achieve what we want. So um, there was some discussion earlier about um, boat registration in some countries and how that, that helped. Um, I have to say, you know, somewhere like Sweden, they don't have boat registration there, yet they've been quite successful with their boat breaking by making it easy for the end user, user to find a, a suitable place to, to break their boat. And they've done that through, through funding, actually through government funding of that, uh, of that process. Um, and I think from, from the EBA's point of view, um, we support that kind of extended producer responsibility model, which says that when you build a boat and you sell it, you put some money aside uh, to dispose of that boat at the end of life, because you're the one who's taking the profit from the sale of that, of that boat initially. Um, and I think it's really important there that you kind of disconnect that payment from that individual boat. So if we started doing that now, then the sale of, of new boats could be funding the work that Steve's doing, dismantling the legacy fleet. There's, there's no need to think about, oh, we've got all these you know, hundreds of thousands of boats that need to be disposed of. They need to be paid for by some legacy fund. It could be paid for by the current industry, by disconnect, making that disconnect if the money goes into a central fund to pay for that disposal. Um, and I think the other, the other really important thing, coming back to what uh, Karina was saying about the, the contamination side of it, is it's not just about the end of life of the boat, it is about that kind of work during um, the maintenance of the boat as well. I mean, I have a 40 year old boat. Um, it's really important that we extend the life of boats as far as we can to, so that they don't become end of life too soon. I, I mean, I think my boat would carry on for another, another 20 years. It's a Vancouver 27, it's very well built. Um, I know Steve's pulling faces there, but um, it, seemed, it seems absolutely sound. It's been very well maintained. The hull is absolutely sound and we should keep maintaining it. But I had to, up to upgrade some of the instruments recently and you know, this question of dust. So even just using simple hand tools on the boat, it's really difficult to stop that plastic from going into the water when you're doing it. So I think education and information is really critical here rather than legislation around that element of it. It's making sure that the boat owners understand the impacts and uh, our experience with with having, I mean, I, I work um, as the EBA Environment Secretary. Um, my my day job is as uh, the Sustainability Manager for the Royal Yachting Association, um, and we have a, a program of providing information to end boat users. And people are usually horrified to discover the impacts they have if they don't understand what those environmental impacts are. So if we can tell people how to do these things in a environmentally friendly way, then the vast majority of them are very willing to do so. So I think we've, we've got to think about that whole life cycle, not just about when it's built in a, in a modular way to make it easy to dismantle at the end of life, not just when it's disposed of at the end of life, but also that entire life cycle in between and all that maintenance work that goes on. Because I, I suspect that that kind of impact is probably just as great through the life of the boat. 
Um, and I think, um, yeah, we, we need to, to think as well about the practicalities for, for boat users. Uh, and as Steve said, how much money they have. As you go through the life of the boat, each su successive owner of the boat generally has less money to spend on it. Um, so we've got to make these things easy and straightforward. Um, yeah. We are um, about to restart the DG Mari project to look at uh, extended producer responsibility and other models for funding end of life boats through the European Commission. That's due to meet again um, at the end of this month. Uh, and that's um, pushed by or it's supported by the European boating industry and ICOMIA and others. Um, and certainly the EBA will be there as well. Um, so I do think there will need to be some legislation at an industry level. Um, but I do think it needs to take account of the fact that we're only about 5% of the waste stream for composites overall. Um, we need to work with the wider composites industry on this. Um, and I think my final point is I th on disposal is I'm... I think that the energy recovery model is probably an interim solution because effectively, certainly with the legacy fleet, we're burning fossil fuels by doing that. And I think we do need to, to look at these kind of more high tech solutions that, that Mario is talking about with being able to extract the resins and reuse them in some way, ultimately to, to get that kind of full uh, circular economy going um, so that we can uh, we can address these these issues in a in a more environmentally friendly way um, that, that considers climate change as well as other forms of pollution. Just an, a final word from let's say from my side uh, before I just sum up what uh, what kind of suggestions uh, we received from you all. Um, it is correct what you are saying, Phil, that uh, let's say our industry is not the main polluter. But the difficulty with our industry is we are working and. Uh, let's say it's a recreational uh, industry uh, on water, inland waters, seas, uh, uh, mar uh, marine protected areas and all that stuff. That means we are always in the picture. And that uh, we have to realize that is one of the, let's say, the issues we always have to cope. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I do agree that we have to uh, yeah. take our responsibility seriously. I'm just saying that there is, you know, that there's a, a lot of money out there in other industries that could help yeah. us with the research side of it to make sure that we find suitable solutions. And uh, I mean, the, the real problem we have, as, as Steve and Karina have, have mentioned, is, is the contamination side of it as well with oils and anti fouls and all sorts of other things. So we do have uh, wider challenges than other parts of the industry. But I, you know, I do think we need to work with the wider industry yeah. on yeah. on the technical solutions, if you like. Yeah. yeah, and I always uh, saying, and let's say I can remember one of the studies we uh, I done, let's say many years ago. Uh, I'm always saying a boat user is not a professional. He's a professional user, yeah. but he is <laughs> not a professional repair and maintenance uh, person, yeah. or a worker, or whatsoever. And everybody is doing on volunteer basis, and they, in, in normally they doing quite well. Yeah. Just summing up. What I received, and if uh, I made a mistake, please correct me. I received, uh, let's say, um, more technical measures uh, during the breaking down. Uh, we have to uh, push the designers more than we have done all the last year. And that's also my personal opinion. Uh, much more working with the materials. Uh, money is still a big issue. We have to solve this. A very good, uh, let's say, idea to work maybe with the insurance companies together. Um, closed loop. I think that's quite interesting to, to bring that more to practical uh, items. Um, energy recovering, uh, also an uh, item what we can use. And then the combination of uh, legislation, uh, standards, international standards in this case, and um, volunteer rules. Uh, what I like to add is something, although I know EBI, EBI is uh, an EBA, uh, ICOMIA, everybody is working together. Uh, but to my opinion, we should be more proactive and also to have a team um, in our industry able and capable, uh, capable to, to bring this more to practice. Leading and moderating discussions for six years is very nice. I'm seeing a lot of solutions, but it is really coming to practice. We have to start on the work floor and we have to make sure that all the boat users understand why we are doing this. And not only for this subject, but also if I look, let's say, the panel we had last week, 
uh, with uh, biofouling, and you mentioned already, Phil, um, uh, the anti-foulings and all these discussions. There's so much, and we have to do it, and uh, we have to, we need to be uh, proactive and uh, looking at all the new pieces of legislations and policy from international uh, governmental authorities, which is my daily work. I can say, uh, yeah, there's no time to lose. We have to start directly as soon as possible. Thank you for all, uh, for let's say all your input. It was a wonderful discussion. And I hope it stays not for a uh, discussion, but we are bringing this up to a higher level to bring it to more practice. Thank you.